very good evening to all of you. Welcome to the first episode of Biz Talk. In this country, currently, we're talking about Startup India, Digital India, Make in India. And we at International Business Times thought that it would be only pertinent now to come up with a special talk show after our success with the talk, wherein we used to invite politicians, bureaucrats, and all the people in public life. We thought, how about now bringing in people from various sectors of business, from startup, so that not only the B2B, B2C, but all of you people get to benefit from it, understand and learn from their lives, from their mistakes, from their successes as well. And starting this new tradition of biz talk, today we have with us the CEO of Wunik.com, Mr. Sajayat Ali. Welcome to the show, and uh, thank you for coming over here for this. So now, talking about Wunik.com, how did you come finally manage to zero in on the name Wunik.com? Because you know, when in a startup or in a new company, I think what to name the company become one major challenge after you have uh, zeroed in on the idea. So how did Wunik.com the name uh, come from? Yeah, actually, like uh, we wanted a name which did not have any previous connotations. We always felt like brand is an empty vessel. And if we get a good vessel, we would be able to fill it with whatever we want. Right? But so we did not want to take any words like fashion or clothing. And we didn't want because everything has its own connotation. So we wanted something, but at the same time, like that's pronounceable, that single word. Uh, and we can also assign a story to it. Like here, we started with the vision to democratize fashion and take it to the masses enable them to find their unique style statement. So we make everybody unique and a play on the word unique was unique. So that's how we came up with it. Now basically then the tactical things are domain name availability, right. and trademark availability, everything fell into place. But uh, the idea was always to have something which doesn't have any previous meaning. So basically unique became unique. Oh, yeah, yeah, so unique, being, unique being the, 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 yeah. the root word for this. Very interesting. Now, you are an online marketplace. So for those of our users, and those of our audiences currently, who are not aware about Wunik.com, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of women out there already are, especially who have taste in Indian wear. But do you, how would you like to describe Wunik.com as? So we are primarily a fashion discovery platform for affordable fashion, primarily, right? So uh, when we started, there were players like Mitra and Jama, focusing on fashion forward, brand conscious, metrocentric customers. And for others who are primarily coming from tier two, tier three, or, or who are looking for a everyday affordable fashion, the only option was horizontals. And horizontals given their poor discovery and uh, uh, no in-depth expertise in any, uh, especially in fashion domain, uh, there, was, there was a big white space. So that's what we targeted, we said, We'll be giving it a flip card price, but a Mitra experience. So we, uh, and for that we had to use a lot of technology because when you deal with few hundred products, it's easy to create good catalog, good images, good pictures, and make the filters work, search work. How would you do when you have like millions of items? That's why Horizontal always just relegated into seller information. Then we used image learning uh, uh, and uh, uh, and a lot of tech to automate those parts. But at the end of the day, our aim is to take fashion to the masses. And uh, just because they cannot afford brand, it doesn't mean they, they should not be fashion. Right? So that's actually a very interesting part with regards to strategy out there. This somehow looks like a blue ocean strategy that you thought that there's already a market yeah. which is already too populated with other startups. Yeah. And you created a new market for yourself. Yeah. How does that fit into the scheme? Yeah, so as, um, again, if you look at fashion market, less than 20% is organized and branded market. And all the companies, like whether they were incumbents like Mintra or Java, or newcomers like Ajio, or, uh, uh, or, or, or even Yebov, everybody were focusing on the 20%. What about the remaining 80%? There is no brand in sari, there is no brand in kurti. What, what, where will these customers go to? And if you look at the recent Facebook PCG study, the next wave of online commerce is being fueled by women 
especially from tier 2 tier 3 especially those who are above 35 year old what about these customer bases what's the best experience for them right so for me this was like really like a blue ocean strategy this was a market which nobody was attacking and they were getting they were relegated to the same poor experience which are result of getting offer so 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 that's why it's not like in hindsight it looks like as if we figured it out but we got there through a lot of trial and error but i think looking back it looks like one of the biggest opportunity which was in plain sight still missed by everybody right so for the benefit uh, of our viewers today i would like to mention that we are in conversation with sujay the ceo of unique.com an online marketplace specializing in women fashion if i am not wrong yeah uh, last year we launched for last year we launched for men as well right yeah. so coming back to the scene of startups in india the idea is the most important thing later on everything else follows that what was the first day that you got the idea of starting owning.com and what click what what pushed you to getting into your own stuff so i think it was a festival day something like a, i think a ramzan or something so uh, when i i i actually went my went to my home and i was dressed up with some of the costliest dressed i think all uh, maybe i think uh, 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 a very costly branded shirt and a very costly jeans and uh, my dad just commented like why are you dressed so badly like look at your brothers they are dressed so well they were wearing a 400 rupee shirt and a 600 rupee jeans so i was stuck like okay so i am wearing some 5000 rupee shirt and probably a 6000 rupee jeans and my dad is commenting that i'm not dressed well so so it was a aha moment for me that Uh, i don't know what suits me <laughs> i don't know like how to dress up myself and it doesn't matter like how much i spend or what brands i go after we need an ability to buy what suits me right and similar way with the, around the same time uh, i think uh, 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 my mom or somebody ended up buying some tablet or laptop that was uh, also very curious for me like i did my college from 97 to 2001 at the time to buy a computer i had to take my friend to find out what the processor to buy what screen to buy etc mom can go and buy it on amazon like what she wants or uh, uh, so so for me like it was it was a uh, moment that if you can buy a laptop without a geek's help why can't you buy clothing without a stylist help why can't you still be stylish so that was kind of the i think the uh, root idea for me like, right so what happened after was how it Yeah, post that like uh, basically like I was in US at the time. I returned to India in 2013. I wanted to start something. This idea was always lingering in my mind. Uh, I most of my experience was in payments. Uh, I, even though I worked at Amazon, it was more on the web services and payments side. So money part was taken care of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can say that. So, but the part was I can run a payment startup which is easily fundable and uh, I can do something because I have the domain expertise. Right? but there was this idea which was uh, kind of eating me so my first reaction was like we go and do the payment startup for four or five years make money and then do this original uh, idea that i had and i was trying to work on a payment startup as well and then suddenly i realized that why should i do this and then get that why can't i do it right now what i realized was time is of the most time is the premium factor right? i don't have a lot of time i don't know what will happen in my life so if i want to go after the unique idea why don't i do it right now so i scrapped all the payment idea and i started working on that it was a lot more difficult to get funded for an e-commerce idea in india but i think uh, it was worth it because i am pursuing my passion my uh, thing that is true so now speaking of your business model i believe you don't hold any inventory I think that's the beauty of the whole thing. You will have zero inventory only of a tech solution in this whole thing. So, what is the business model like? How does it work? Uh, yeah, primarily. So, so when when we came with this business model, we said no discount, uh, no inventory, uh, no fulfillment centers, right? Because these three are the major drains in any uh, unit economics, right? In any business model, uh, inventory losses, discounts, and uh, the shipping losses that you encounter, right? So. But we wanted to provide the same retail-like experience, even though we are a marketplace. 
So, and the answer was tech. You have to create a lot of tech, a lot of checks and balances. Today, our order will reach a customer faster than an Amazon marketplace order. Amazon has its own uh, fulfillment uh, team and fulfillment people delivering parts. I don't have anything. I just work with all third party couriers, but my tech is so tightly integrated. Similar with discounts, like always money prices will be cheaper than Amazon. And Amazon has to put like money from its pocket to enable that. I get all through supply chain optimization. So without any discount, I can match the price. The best part about this is this is long term. Suddenly, even if I run out of money, my prices are not going to go up. My fulfillment time is not going to shoot up. Uh, my my selection is not going to go down because I'm not able to procure in one way. I think so. This lightweight model is uh, it's very beautiful and. I think, I think early players like eBay kind of screwed it up because they didn't put the actual checks and balance system and they exposed the marketplace model in all its uh, flesh to the customers which is not digestible for a customer. Customer wants a retail like experience. Market the accountability is, I think. Correct, exactly. So you have to take that accountability. You cannot say seller didn't ship the right product, seller shipped the right So how do you address that issue? So first, we take the accountability. We said it's Monique's fault. You bought from Monique, so we have to make sure that the item is delivered at the right time, at the right condition, and uh, in the right way that you want it. Right. So, uh, so, so that's the first step, right? Once you take accountability, then you come up with uh, strategies and tech to solve for everything, right? Uh, you you start. Looking at sellers' late shipment, right? You, uh, you start looking at sellers' complaint, right? You start looking at uh, which product uh, most of the time gets this uh, size uh, ratio mismatch. So you get a lot into analytics, a lot into data, and uh, and um, I think I think at the end of the day, uh, uh, if you provide proper tools and visibility to the sellers, they also don't want to incur losses by selling a wrong item or by getting a huge pile of returns, right? So it's just a matter of giving the right tools and right analytics. And we as a company focusing on those right. numbers like as if our life is dependent on that. Yes, our life is dependent on that. Right? So I think, I think, I think it's, it's, it's all efficiency. It's all it's all about efficiency. Sir, I'll, I'll dig it a little deeper into this question. Because, you know, supply chain and logistics management has become a really big issue for everybody. And in a country like India, now, you said you offer tech solution, but how exactly do you ensure that human error becomes minimum when it comes to shipping the right product yeah. and eventually then you are the, the company which manages yeah. your logistics, they are all also delivering at the same time. Yeah. When you start, at that time your orders are lesser, yeah. it's easier to track. Okay. But when you when, when you expand yeah. at that time, you scale up, at yeah. that time the, the sheer scale of the entire scale of the entire operation becomes very difficult to track. So how do you address that? Yeah. Again, first of all, it's a mindset problem, right? So, you are very right. When you start, you have a different mindset. Even if an order is delayed, you as a founder yourself can just take your bike and go and deliver. It's easy to solve. But when you have like uh, lakhs of items, uh, how do you how do you address those tens of items which are like uh, routed wrongly or uh, delivered wrongly? Right? So, again, it all goes back to the systems that you put in place uh, for efficiency and this one I stress because other than few players like Amazon and Flipkart, none of them have the systems today in India. Lack of, without systems you can't do anything. That lack of systems is biting them very hard. For us like every step has its own checks and balance. Every step has its own workflow, its own escalation mechanism. and. Um, and uh, the truth is, it's not easy to do, right? So, uh, so we hired uh, Raghu, who set up Amazon's uh, marketplace, the seller fulfilled marketplace, as CEO, who helped set up all this operation, uh, operational aspects for us. So, 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 so the I think I said it's a mindset where you look at every place that could go wrong, 
Yeah. We've got a lot of alarms, and monitors, and uh, checks and balance checks because at the end of the day, there's no secret sauce. Exactly. Yes. So now back to our users that uh, our audience is currently, we are in conversation with Sujaya Delhi, the CEO of Wooning.com. So far, we have discussed how the idea of Wooning.com you know, materialized, how, what is the business model, and how do they you know, fulfill the gaps in their logistics management and uh, you know, otherwise in the company, and what checks and balances they have in place in ensuring customer satisfaction. We'll talk about customer service, customer satisfaction a bit later in this particular show, but now the important part is technology. Everybody is offering these tech solutions. How is Wooning.com different from other online marketplaces, number one? And tell us more about these new technologies that you know, started using, like Matstack and all of that. We would like to know more about that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so there are two kinds of tech, right? One that is required uh, for post startup processing. Again, as I said, only very few players have cracked it, like Amazon, Flipkart. All other players are doing a very uh, loose job of it because uh, because I think I think uh, they are not understanding the importance of uh, tracking every hour and making sure the customer gets it right. Away. But still, as I said, it's it's it has been done before. Uh, given that I and my CEO who worked in Amazon, I worked for seven years. He worked for eleven years. We have combined eighteen years. We have seen Amazon systems. We know it's what works, what doesn't work, so we can develop the next generation systems which are probably 10x better than Amazon. But the truth is we have some domain knowledge there, so we are able to build the system. But it has been done before. What we have done on the pre-order side, before placing the order, the cataloging side, that is something that was not done before. As I said, today the biggest problem in fashion is how do you get the catalog or the product information correct? This shirt is what I'm selling. I need to know what is the collar type, what is the pattern, what is the sleeve length, uh, what is the type, is it a shirt or a t-shirt right now. Horizontals depend on sellers. Sellers give wrong information. Not deliberately, but unknowingly. Because most of them it's not standardized. Somebody might call it polka, somebody might call it dotted, somebody might call it different, maybe stripes or something like that. Right? So there's no standardization. The seller is not an acute knowledge blood enough to do it professionally. And sometimes the seller doesn't care, right? Sometimes the seller deliberately cheats. He thinks uh, uh, maybe a particular design is trending. He knows his design is not that, but he will still use the term because he will come up in search uh, better and he will get more orders, right? So you have all types of such edge cases. So we came up with this idea that uh, all you need is an image. Image doesn't lie, right? You learn from the image. The good part is by end of 2014 when we launched our app, uh, the image recognition had come into its maturity. So today I would say we have benchmarked against all the image tech players. Our tech which is actually in-house is the best tech in identifying a product. If I just upload, take a picture in a phone and upload this shirt, it will identify color type, sleeve length, pattern, and for women, hemline, uh, what sari is it, is it see-through or not? All the parameters are learned like using image and it is more accurate than human. And users can also search that they want to So all this information now it is fed into personalization, fed into filters, fed into search. So when you go and search for a black see-through sari, you will be able to like pick it up. The other part is I can like also consolidate. Go and search for blue velvet sari in Amazon. You will see hundred products, same product, maybe different model, different angle, different light. It's a bad user experience. So we will be able to identify that these are similar products, same product, maybe sold by multiple sellers, just combine, give one product detail page, and, and uh, give the buy button to the best seller based on the price and the uh, seller rating, etc. Right? So, uh, so that, whatever we have developed, whether it's in terms of personalization, whether in terms of uh, image recognition, and, and, and even predicting the trends. Today we are working on a AI designer which will be replacing our stylist by predicting, coming up with its own design based on data. That, I think we are working on cutting edge. I don't think anybody has done all of this before. Right, that's pretty interesting. So again, reminding you all of guys that we are in conversation with the Shajayatani, CEO of Wooning.com. 
and uh, in case some of you are management students, I'm pretty sure they must be enjoying this because we have already spoken about your ocean strategy, we have discussed about the supply chain thing. So I think most of your topics we are already covering in this particular show today. Now talking about customer service today, uh, I think that becomes ultimately every company begins that uh, our motto is to give best customer service. Now it's a very loose term. When it comes to actually delivering it, it becomes like really a difficult, humongous task. And we have seen in the past that how major companies have failed despite having a good product, great tech, but their customer service killed them. Yeah. Now, how are you ensuring that in, from your company, the customer service part is taken care of? Yeah, I think, I think it's true, right? Even to be honest, like somewhere in the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, even we lost the plot. It was, we were growing so fast. In fact, like between December and January, we doubled and our every team was overwhelmed, right? And then like we had to put in a lot of systems in place. So today, I'm happy that our app is the highest rated among e-commerce apps in Android Play Store. In fact, when we launched Mr. Munik app, it is rated at uh, 4.6, and, uh, and these are on very high rating. Customer service NPS, we have the highest in the industry. So, if, so these are customers who have a complaint and who have spoken to our reps and still end up giving us very high net promoter score, right? Uh, primarily, I think we have we have focused on, for example, if you take customer service, we have focused on the net promoter score as the single metric, which we track every day and we see if it goes down, if there is a detractor, why she was not happy and what can we do to it better, right? Again, I said there's no secret sauce. It's just that you need systems you need to spend time building that system. And it's very hard to uh, to even think about all the areas that can go wrong and build checks and balances for them. So as I said in my previous answers, it's all it's all coming down to that. Because customer service is not that if a customer asks for uh, uh, five day shipping, I will give one day shipping, or I will give the items a 50% discount, putting money from my pocket. That is not customer service, right? So customer service is about what we define as providing a consistent customer experience and delivering what we promise. Right? Mm -hmm. So all the metrics are around them. For delivery also we will look at uh, how, how many delivery attempts we were able to do within the promise date. It's not about did I do in one day or two days, it doesn't matter. If I promised four days, I was able to deliver in four days. Right? Same on the customer service side as well, we look at uh, uh, what are the how many, uh, how many uh, customer calls we were able to deliver, uh, resolve within the first attempt, uh, and uh, uh, how many customers are satisfied on the first call. So we look at a lot of input metrics as well. Uh, and, and again, the truth is like, at least on the post order side, most of this has been already solved by Amazon. <laughs> and all we have to do is, but it is difficult to replicate them, but if you put our minds to it, uh, we will be able to do it. Right. Now, talking about the way you started Mune was app only, and then eventually you went to desktop. Yes. And we have seen many players doing that. You know, they, yes. they, they, all, they were on web before, they shut their websites, they went to the app, and then suddenly they realized, oh no, that's not going to work in India, and then they went on to website. How did your journey went in through mobile app, then to the website? So, see, even today our uh, desktop by itself is less than 10%. 90% is mobile. We were always a mobile first player from 2014 when we launched our app. Right? So we launched our uh, our actual platform at the beginning of 2014. At that time, it was desktop, but uh, that time we were more of an affiliate player. And by the time we got our product market fit, it was on the app. So it made sense for us to focus on the app. And we were a very small team at that time. We didn't even have our Series A, so uh, we thought like. It, it's best for us to focus on the app and get all the users on the app and provide a great experience there. And um, in fact, we did that even before Vitra went app only, right? We probably were the first to do that. And uh, and later on, almost a year later, around like October, October 2014 is when we launched our app. October 2015 is when we uh, launched our desktop. Again, the idea was not to get a bigger market share using desktop. The idea was to launch desktop for my app customer. When she's not using app, when she's in front of a big screen like a laptop or a, 
monitor at our office uh, how to provide a continued experience to them in the, in the desktop, right? So that's why we launched desktop. Until date, desktop is an is uh, accessible. It's my customers are not desktop customers. I acquire There's customers additional, only mobile. additional way of them coming. It's for I acquire only using mobile. It's for my mobile customers. If they are in front of a desktop, they should be able to seamlessly transact, or view their orders and rewards and stuff. Right. So that's the only purpose of desktop. A mobile website is different. There we have been proven wrong. When we launched app, our initial idea was to use mobile website just as an acquisition vehicle for app. And uh, uh, because we thought mobile experience was inferior. But what we learned was, uh, especially when we did our television ad and all of that, uh, customers first want to browse through mobile site and buy before they install an app. And a uh, lot of people have storage issues, they don't want to install too many apps. So mobile website is how they date with them, right? So it is very important that we provide a good mobile website experience. So that we had to correct actually only in 2016. Okay. And uh, today, like if you look at men, for example, Mobile website, we are able to get the customer acquisition cost back in the first transaction itself, which is not possible in half. So, mobile website has become far more efficient and economical. Uh, but yeah, that's how. So where, where are you currently app download wise? What numbers are there? So before I give the number, I, yeah. let me say it's a vanity metric. Yeah. Yes, we have crossed. Uh, because like, I'm coming <laughs> to that question. <laughs> yes. so, 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 we have crossed like between men and women, we have crossed like 30 million downloads. Okay. Might sound big. What about your monthly active users yeah. currently? Yeah. So monthly active would be around like six to seven million users. Right. That's a fair, fairly good number. Again, I said those are. Um, uh, again, if you look at monthly active user as well, if you have to split by desktop and web, and, sorry, website and app, yeah. it will be uh, it will be probably split evenly. Like so. So what I'm saying is, uh, desktop monthly active user is not as good as mobile website. Mobile website monthly active user is not as good as an app monthly active user. So, so the number wise, it looks good. Right. But now, yeah. coming to the acquisition of customers, mm -hmm. what did you do? How did you push your app in the market initially? Because a lot, we have seen a lot of players doing a lot of things. But you know, as a startup in India at that particular time, what were the strategies that you adopted to push for app downloads? So again, like, let me start with saying there's no secret sauce, right? Yeah. Because when I started my startup, I used to look at companies like Mintra, Java, and like, how do we get to traction like that? How do we get downloads like that? Maybe they know something that I don't know, right? So after I have reached like 30 million downloads and this many my use, what I realized is there was no secret sense, right? right? That's the first thing that you have to realize. It's not like uh, I know something which a startup doesn't know, right? Everybody has to go through. can't be standardized. Yeah, everything has to, everyone has to go through the same journey. But I think um, we have to focus on one channel and go deep, deep, deep into the channel and you, until you know about the channel better than anybody else. For us, it was Facebook. So we didn't work on Google. We didn't work That's on very interesting. Yeah. So we did Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. That we were able to tell like what every uh, everything in Facebook would mean like. If you put an amount, what will be the spending pattern for Facebook? How often you have to change the image? Uh, what kind of images you should put? What's the, what's, what, how, how do you set the CPI? Should you be setting it by CPI? Should you be setting it by CPM? Should you be setting it by CPA? Right? Uh, I think you learn so deep about it that you get confidence that I can do this better than anybody else. I think Today, a dollar that I spend in Facebook comes back to me as a revenue in one dollar. I don't think any company, at least in India, gets that kind of ROI from Facebook. What's your take on you know, all these new startups? I've seen a lot of youngsters making these mistakes. They go to third party app downloads where the, on third party websites or third party apps. They give some incentive for app downloads yeah. and then they go. But those users aren't really trustworthy. They might give you numbers, yeah. but they don't give you business eventually. So what's your take on something like that? So I think um, the quality of the channel is very, very important. The reason why we pick Facebook is 
not just because uh, it gives you quantity, it also gives you quality. Uh, it depends. For some other startup, it could be Google. Okay. See, for us, if you really know what you want to buy, if you are looking for an Alan Soli checked blue shirt, you are better off buying at Amazon. So, for a startup which focus on the internal customers, who will work better? Because they will search in Google and you have to get the results. We are targeting customers who don't know what to buy. And we are trying to solve for engagement. We are trying to solve the boredom problem. So where are the bored users today? They're either in WhatsApp or Facebook. WhatsApp doesn't allow us to do this, so only choice is Facebook, right? So first you need to have that channel product fit, right? So once you have the fit, I think, now can there be a product where you can still acquire customers through this you know, tabs or uh, other, uh, other uh, channels where you can pay for uh, uh, installs, right? Uh, uh, I think uh, that, um, uh, see, one thing I have learned is like, we cannot rule everything out. I cannot just go and say those third party things are bad, only Facebook is good, right? Maybe for some startup it could work out. But what they have to understand is if they know that the quality is bad, still they are doing it for vanity metric, it will affect their product because you get the users, right? What will the rest of your team be doing? Improving the funnel, improving the conversion. If you keep giving them bad traffic, they will be optimizing for wrong traffic. So the real users will never be able to convert better. So in the long run, you will be hurting your product. Right. So I think whatever is your business is, whatever the channel is, you have to make sure that the channel brings you high quality customers so that the rest of the team can work on converting them better. Right. We're going to be talking about marketing in a while, but we'll just remind our users that we are in conversation with Sujayatati, the CEO of Vonik.com. A very interesting conversation. In case you have missed it, and in case you are somebody who is into startups or who wants to start a new startup or you are a management student or in general, just for general knowledge, I do very strongly recommend, please go back and watch this video from the beginning. There's a lot of learning in this video for you. Now, coming back to the marketing part, should I, uh, what channels did you explore? I've seen your ads on TV, but uh, how about digital? How much of that did you explore in terms of marketing? It was a mixed year. Yeah. So, so TV was uh, very... Uh, Say like uh, not a primary channel for us. We just did for uh, a few months. Primarily, we focus on digital, we focus on quality channels like Facebook, Google, and some quality of free. It's not all of free. And we also put 10 percentage of our marketing for a lot of experimentation because we want to catch the wave before others catch. And that's the key in marketing. If everybody knows a trick in Facebook. By the time you get to it, it's, it's exactly. a CPA would have already shot it. So you should find that. So always we put a budget on experimenting. I think television was uh, for us uh, a way to. Uh, uh, so we were an affiliate player earlier, and then we moved to become our own marketplace. At that time, we needed to communicate that to the user. So was more of branding. So it was more of the branding and communicating that now we are slightly different from what you know as before. Before we had relationships like with Jabong, Zoe, Fashion, etc. So we were selling their products. Now we are selling our own products. So that's why television was important. But post the transition, we almost stopped television. We do only during sales or something. Right. Now, your company has been known to do a lot of small, small acquisitions, or as we call them, acquihire. Right. The new term which I came to came across because of this, like private tri card was one of those. What's your take on that? How did that come into the scheme of thing when you were trying to develop a new product and suddenly as a startup you're acquiring new smaller startups? Second, see, uh, mostly like when we uh, look at a startup, most of these are very small acquisitions. And, uh, either the startups have uh, need a platform to, for example, let's take trial that is, they had a very good image recognition technology, but they needed a killer application for it. They were in search of it. Or other startups like Style, which thought it was too early to the market. So, uh, so my first conversation with these companies will be like, "Hey, your vision is going to be broken if you come here. Right? You are going to operate on my vision. It's always better for you to work on your own vision. Right? But if you think you are ahead of the market, you need some time to get back to your vision. Uh, then probably it makes sense for us to uh, work together." Right? 
and we acquired companies whenever we were in need, need of tech that was super important to us like with trial card image recognition tech with Deco it was on the chatbot tech we'll be launching some uh, regional stylish chatbots like uh, in the next few months so we have been working on it for more than six months what is it all about would you like to elaborate a bit yeah so it's basically like as i said we are working on this next generation commerce but not for the teens and tweens, but for, uh, as I said, these women, 35 plus, coming from tier two, tier three. Like uh, that's very interesting. So, so how do we make them come to commerce, right? Uh, really, my mom, my aunt, they are good examples. All they know to do in phone are three things: they can WhatsApp, they can watch, they can do Facebook, uh, they can watch hot stuff or YouTube. That's it. Sometimes some people don't even know how to store a number. Okay, <laughs> that their son or daughter have to do. So for me, commerce has to be integrated into this, right? We started with feeds like Tinder, like feed and other feeds based on Facebook, so that somebody who knows Facebook can browse through our feed. Next, uh, we launched something called Mooning TV, which is a set of videos. People can watch videos, and if they like it, they can click and buy the products in the video, which was modeled after Hotstar. And third, now with the chatbot, we are getting into WhatsApp style, right? Like we want to replace the role of a shopkeeper in regional language. I want to allow my mom to speak to our app in her regional language. How she will speak to a shopkeeper. Show me that sari, show me that color sari, will this sari suit me, is this the latest design. Uh, we have already cracked it in English now, but we haven't launched it because we don't think that uh, power will be uh, visible when you do it in English. Right. So currently we are now getting into the regional language mode for how many languages are you going to run first? Uh, first it will be in Hindi, then very quickly we will follow it up with Tamil and Telugu. Right, that's lovely. Now for the benefit of all the youngsters out there who are in engineering or who are planning their startups next, right? how important is an angel investor initially once you are, you know, your startup is in the basic phase and people are interested in it, your idea is good, now how important is in picking the right angel investor for those people? I think uh, it's, it's, it's obviously it's very, very important uh, because uh, a good investor can take your startup to places which you can never imagine and if, that, if a good investor has a very good vision your visions can compound and multiply and take you to great places. A bad investor can stop you from going anywhere. What you have to understand is, if you get an angel investor, when you go to seed round, the first person that the seed investor will speak to is the angel investor. If he or she is not super bullish about your startup, if he or she is not selling your startup uh, so aggressively, the seed investor is not going to buy you. This is true. When a Series A guy comes in, the first investor, the first person he will speak to is a Series guy. Series B guy will speak to Series A guy. So any one step you go around, even though they like your team, they like your execution, they like you, they will be very reluctant to put in money because they will always feel like the current investors will have more more knowledge about your company than anyone else. And if they are reluctant, they will always back off. Okay. So this means like nowhere in this chain you can have one bad element. So just break the future of your company's fundraising. Which is a very important thing that you raised over here. Now we're talking about Indian startups in general. We haven't seen many very successful Indian startups which make a lot of profit as well. We've seen a lot of money being raised, but when it comes to making profits or at least you know, getting in some cash element into it, that has not really happened in the Indian uh, scheme of things. But what do you think could be the reason behind that? See, Indian startups are good at doing one thing, which is to deliver what they are asked to do. Nobody asked for profit, so they did not deliver profit. You ask for profit, I don't think there will be anybody more capable than Indian startups who can deliver profits. They have been doing it for a long time before this uh, startup uh, or this PC industry came. Right. So now tell me, what would be your advice to all the youngsters out there, all the management graduates currently studying in the IIMs or IITs or in regular colleges as well, who really have dreams when they want to create a new startup, they have a great idea. Now how should they go about it? What are the advices that you would like to give them? Yeah, I think first thing is uh, you need to be able to stand on your own legs. You cannot say that uh, this startup will be successful only if I get angel investment, only if I get seed investment. 
you should be able to run your startup without any investing. Only then you should start. Invest, the investment can accelerate the path towards your vision, but it cannot be a prerequisite for you to start your startup. If you start like that, you are set up for failure from day one. The second thing is you have to do something what you are passionate about, not because you are a domain expert is something, not because an area is hurt. As I said, I worked a lot on payments. And when I started in 2030, payments was hard. E-commerce was a, a black path. Still, I went after what I was passionate about. Right? So I think it's very important that you go after what you're passionate about. Third thing is you have to religiously believe in your idea, like religiously, because there are going to be hundreds of people who are going to say, no, this will not work. When I came down to India, my first round of meeting with all the investors, everybody gave me advice. This is not going to work. Why don't you go back to payments as another startup? Why don't you do a SaaS startup? This is never going to work. They gave me so many uh, examples of fab and other things. It doesn't matter whether I'm going to succeed or fail, but I'm content that I worked on my passion and I'm never going to regret that. I'm not living someone else's dream, right? So it's very important that you religiously believe in so that even if 100 people say this is not going to work, not even an iota, you kind of uh, waver and think like maybe this startup is not going to work. Right? Because that happens, then you are going to have a lot of self-doubt and it's just a vicious cycle which is just killing your startup. Right. 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 Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for that. And so that was Sujaya Tari, the CEO of Hooning.com, giving you all those wonderful pearls of wisdom for your upcoming startups in case you're planning to start one. Now that's all that we have for you today. We'll come back to you next week with a new episode and a new guest. Till then, do take care of yourselves.